ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another live episode of the Officer Nate podcast. It has been a minute uh, since we've done a podcast episode uh, on here, but I've got uh, I've got an awesome guest with me today. He is an active duty police officer. Uh, he's got a large following on TikTok. He's a funny dude. If you go look up his videos on TikTok, uh, you will laugh your ass off and you will get a very good sense of the uh, the humanity and relatability uh, of police officers. He showcases that very well. So joining me tonight live is Gray Scott, the TikTok Peacock. What's up, my man? What's going on, brother? How you doing? Ah, uh, man, I'm good. I'm good. Good. Well, thanks for thanks for joining me tonight. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it was it was yesterday you were live on TikTok and, and I jumped in your live as I was walking on the treadmill and someone had asked you a question about something like what's the most serious crime or, or call that you've ever dealt with. And you were you were kind of explaining how, you know, that's that's not really stuff that cops like to talk about, especially like on a live TikTok where you're trying to keep things light and, uh, you know, just trying to keep things lighthearted. That's not really darkness you want to bring to the surface. But then I asked you, I'm like, well, what's the most, what's the most petty, petty call you've ever, you've ever been to or, or have ever dealt with? And you came up with some pretty funny stuff. Um, so just real quick, and then I'll have you respond. Oh. But in my last agency that I worked for, which was the Bellevue Marshal's office here in Idaho, my very last call that I remember going to was a loud rooster call. Somebody had complained on their neighbor because they had a rooster in the backyard, which is against the city ordinance to have farm animals. And I went out to this house and this Hispanic woman answered the door and she didn't speak any English. And I'm trying to explain to her that she has to keep her rooster quiet because it's disturbing the neighbors. And it was the most <laughs> awkward and uncomfortable call and the most petty. I'm like, is this this is really what I'm doing with my time right now? So um, what was the you, and you gave some pretty good examples. I know you mentioned spiders and snakes and things like that. What's what's some of the some of the the bullshit that you've had to deal with it's it's usually the animal complaints like pit bulls are my biggest thing we get you know at my last agency and the agency i work for right now we get so many calls about pit bulls and people automatically assume that they're vicious because they're a pit bull you know sure. that's the reputation they have and and it's just like, how do you know the dog's vicious? Like, have, did you get out and try to pet it? Like, or did right. you just assume because it's running around and it looked at you funny that it, it's vicious? I, so animal complaints for me are the, are the biggest, like, petty complaints that we get. That and and people calling 911 with no emergency. Mm. Like, I, I just, I've never, I still don't understand it. Eight years in this profession, I still don't get it. Um we actually got a call a few years ago at my last agency. We got a call, somebody called 911 about a dog on a roof of a house. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we're driving around the neighborhood because they didn't give us the address. They just kind of, they gave us the road it was on. So yeah. we're, you know, we're all driving around trying to find this dog on a roof. And sure enough, we come up to a house and I'm like, uh, dispatch that there there's a dog on the roof <laughs> it's there it sure enough there. it's it's there it's just chilling it's a chocolate lab just hanging out on the roof barking at everybody that walked by and drove by it's okay like i'm not gonna go try to get it down like the owners weren't home um we ended up talking to the owners uh a few hours later and they were like yeah they showed us exactly how he gets up like there was a wood pile back there behind their house that he would use Mm -hmm. He would climb up on that wood pile, jump up on the roof, and that's where he would hang out. They said he would hang out there for hours a day, like just just chill. It's his favorite spot. Okay, that's a, yeah, it's a spot. Leave him alone. Yeah. So, but yeah, for me, man, the the petty calls are just the animal complaint. The calls that don't even amount, like they don't have anything to do with police officers. Like mm -hmm. why why call the police for for these things? I just don't get it. Yeah. I don't get it. We used to get calls like if the power went out, people would call the cops. Like, hey, what's the deal with the power? How That's are another we supposed one. to know? You know, call the That's call another. the power company. Yeah, we had uh, I've we've we've got that at my last agency. We dealt with that all the time. Uh, people would call, 
we've got power out here. We've got power out there. We've got power out here. I'm like, we're not, we're not the utility department. We don't handle the power. Like we're well aware that the power is out because it's out where we are too. But you know, like <laughs> call somebody else. Yeah. What do you want us to do? What are we supposed to do? How are they, how, how is a cop supposed to respond? Come out there and go, yep, your, your power's out. Sure I'm, is. Let me walk, let me walk through the house real quick. Yeah. yeah make sure the light bulbs work. are plugged yeah, in. Yeah. <laughs> I, sorry i'm sorry about your luck yeah yeah it's out at my house too um so you've been on the job eight years yeah, well it'll be it'll be eight years in august uh so right there yet yeah. okay and you mentioned at least one different agency how many different agencies have you worked for uh the agency i'm with right now is my second agency i was with my first agency for uh just under seven years Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. So, and just, um, just patrol, have you worked different, uh, different assignments? Uh, or? So at my last agency, I was, uh, it was I, both agencies I've worked for are smaller agencies. Uh, my last agency, they had a SWAT team, um, about a year after I was hired, we implemented like a, a gang investigations department, if you would. Um, yeah. So myself and another officer um, took over that. We were the gang investigators of the of the department or the agency. Mm -hmm. um, so we would do a lot of gang saturation patrols with other departments around uh, around the area. Uh, I was on SWAT. I'm, I'm still SWAT certified. So I did SWAT. I was also a, a bike patrol officer. So I got to ride a little bicycle around town every now and then. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, what else did I do? I think those were that, that was the three like extra uh duties that I had. Other than that, I was patrol. I was a sergeant in my last agency. Um and and now, you know, I'm just bottom of the totem pole with this one. So Yeah, was there something that uh, something that caused you to to switch agencies? I mean, it was something some issue with your previous department or you just found a better opportunity yeah. at your new one? Uh so last year I went through a pretty pretty uh bad divorce and uh, uh and if anybody's been through a divorce they they know how it goes and it, it weighs on your psyche a little bit mm -hmm. and uh i say a little bit but a lot so um i'm not gonna say that my performance like didn't waver it did it definitely affected me uh um, sure. to the point to where i ended up losing my job with the last department and okay. you know it is what it is at the end of the day um i, I didn't understand why when it happened, but mm -hmm. you know, today the agency that I'm with now, I guess you could say the grass is greener on the other side. So, well, that's good, dude. I've, so I've had a similar, a similar experience. I've only, I only worked for two agencies during my, during my tenure in law enforcement. And, um, my first agency was with the twin falls police department. And I worked there for about 12 years. I got fired from that agency as well, not for doing TikToks that went viral or anything like that. But, you know, I went through a divorce, um, you know, an, another like failed relationship after that. Those things cause those th those things sort of bleed over into your professional life. And, uh, you know, once I mean, I, and I kind of get this this feeling that it's a trend with administrators like chiefs and captains, mayors, things like that, that that, you know, once once they see that that you're human. And that, you know, you might have a weak side, a vulnerable side, and sometimes that might affect your work performance. They kind of have their eye on you. And, uh, you know, they're not going to, they, they usually don't, they don't let up. And, you know, this is not me playing victim. This is not me being, being paranoid about, about police administrators. I've heard this from several, several officers that, you know, if you show, if you show a sign of, a sign of weakness or a sign of slowing down in any way, then they view you as kind of a wild card and they don't like that. And, um, after you're labeled such, you know, they're, they're looking for a reason to get rid of you. Absolutely. Um, uh, you know, in, in my social media, my TikTok, I, it actually, I feel like it played a big role in it too. Yeah. Um, I had gotten in, into not really trouble, but they had an issue with my TikTok. They were okay with me posting when I initially started posting on TikTok and doing TikTok. Uh, they were okay with me posting uniform and, and doing all of that. And mm -hmm. then as my account began to blow up and I began to, began to grow and my videos began to go more viral, 
uh, they finally shut it down and said, hey, we don't want you posting in uniform anymore. Mm -hmm. And we want you to go ahead and take down all the videos that you have as well. Uh, so I had to remove my first my first ever video I posted on TikTok uh, was a duet with Officer Kingry. Mm -hmm. Had like 5 million views. Yeah, I gained like 10,000 followers within like three days off of that one video. Uh -huh. uh, and then I had two or three more videos that went incredibly viral. So yeah, I had to take all of it down. So I lost all of that. Um, but the, you know, the agency I'm with now, they're extremely supportive of my, my social media and what I do on social media. Um, you know, I explained to them when I went through the interview process, my social media for me is it's a way to humanize the badge and it's a way to show people that we are human and that we have a life outside of being cops. You know, you know, we're yeah. not these mindless robots that people seem to think we are that the media portrays us as like, no, I come home and. I come home and chill just like anybody else. I crack open a cold beer. I watch TV. I mow the yard, whatever I do, you know? Mm -hmm. so. Well, and it's a great way to do it. And it's too bad that your previous agency, you know, that they decided to take that route. I mean, I don't know. I, I imagine it might have had something to do with, with somebody complaining about one of your videos or something. At least that's how, that's how my well, experience sure. went, mm -hmm. you know? Um, it, it's, it's funny because they, your administrators, Okay, so with my experience with the Bellevue Marshal's office, my marshal, right, my boss, the head, the head honcho, she was all about it. She loved my TikToks that I did in my uniform, you know, just like you. I was about humanizing the badge, showing the, the human relatable side of police officers. You know, we're human beings just like anybody else. We can be silly. We can joke around and mess around and, and have a good time. And my videos became very popular. You know, they they loved it. I had I had quite a following. Mm -hmm. Um but then I did that LeBron James TikTok and sort of wandered over into the political realm. And that's when everything went sideways because I worked in, a, in an area that was very liberal and yep. they did not like that, that one bit. Of course, and, and they, you know, they, they fired me for, you know, social media policy violation, even though they had no issues with any of my other TikToks that I had done right up until up until that one. So, and it was because they, you know, they started getting complaints from a lot of the liberals, um, you know, residents uh, in the area. And of course, you know, it, it kind of ruffled their liberal feathers as well. Oh, absolutely. You know, you've got a liberal mayor and a liberal city council, the entire city council. And uh, you know, you make a, you make a video supportive of law enforcement, which for some reason seems to be a partisan issue, mostly conservative America or, or supportive of law enforcement. And, uh, yeah, they didn't they didn't like it one bit, but um, up until that point, they didn't have a problem with me making the Bellevue Marshal's office look good with my other videos. So I get and where you're coming from. Yeah, that's kind of, you know, when it was brought to my attention that they wanted me to go ahead and pull the reins back and stop posting in uniform and take everything down in uniform. It was there was complaints. Um, you know, obviously, I don't know who complained, but. You know, I don't live in a very big town. I live in a pretty small town. So mm -hmm. where everybody knows everybody, it's very political. Um, so, you know, it is what it is. You know, I don't have any ill will towards them and I don't have any, you know, bad thoughts towards towards the last agency I worked for. Um, sure. There's a lot of good people there and it is a good agency. It's a good department. Um, so, yeah. Well, that's good. I mean, yeah, there's, there's no reason to hold grudges. You know, you do, you do what you do and you oh, move yeah. on, you know? So, I mean, you, I mean, you're still, I mean, you've got a large following on TikTok. You've, uh, you've got yep. like over 300,000 followers. I think the last I checked and your videos do very well. They get lots of views, lots of engagement. They're funny. Um, so yeah. How did you, how did you first go about like what, you know, what was your first, inkling how did you how did you get started on tiktok like what made you go hey i'm gonna start wow. doing videos on tiktok i've always enjoyed social media um at my last agency myself and another officer um we actually started making these videos on snapchat with like the funny filters you know the mm -hmm. big mouth filter um there was a filter that we used with like these big glasses made your face huge and your mouth real small we just started using these filters and we come up with these alter egos of officer Doolittle and officer Doohickey. And we just kind of did our own little skits mm -hmm. and we would post them on Facebook. This is before I even knew about TikTok. 
Yeah. We would post these videos on Facebook and on Facebook, they would, you know, get 10, 20,000 views and mm -hmm. people loved them. They loved them. Um, once COVID hit and, and I feel like majority of creators on TikTok got on TikTok during quarantine, you know, yeah. because what else do you have to do? You sit around right. the house. Let's watch some videos on our phone. Yeah. Um, so when quarantine and COVID hit, I remember I was laying in bed with uh, my now ex-wife and she was laughing her ass off. And I'm like, what are you laughing at? She's like, oh, I'm watching TikTok. And I was like, what the hell is TikTok? So she starts showing me some of the videos she's watching. And I'm like, it's pretty funny stuff. Mm -hmm. So I downloaded it. Um, and initially I downloaded it with no intent on ever making content or making videos or anything like that. Just downloaded it to watch videos, you know. And then people in my hometown, they're like, hey, you should you should do these. You know, you would be good at it. You're funny. You got a good personality. We think you'd be good at it. So that's when I brought it to my chief's attention and said, hey, would you be okay with me doing TikTok videos as a way to humanize the badge? Yeah. At, at the time, he was completely okay with it. Um, so it was, it was kind of, I guess you would say, not necessarily peer pressure, but, you know, just people encouraging me in the community to, uh, to branch out and, and try it. Yeah. Um, and it's worked out. It's worked out. And, a, and almost this will be August. August will be two years that I've been posting on TikTok. Okay. And, uh, and yeah, I'm about to hit 400,000 followers. So in two years, almost 400K, I'd, I'd say it's worked out pretty well for me. Nice. And you've been able to keep your original account this whole time? Yeah, I, I've, I haven't got knock on wood wherever some is. I, my account has not been banned you. ever. <laughs> that must be, that must um, be nice. <laughs> yeah, I... Uh, I mean, it's at risk, you know, I get that little, that little at risk thing. Cause I'll have videos taken down here and there. Yeah. Um, and then I'll get a little notification saying, you know, your account's at risk of being permanently removed or whatever, um, yeah. for multiple violation, community guideline violations. But luckily, yeah, luckily, uh, this has been the, the same account that I've had, uh, for the, for the duration. So good hopefully it's hopefully it stays that way and like i said it's it's it sucks when you have a large following and TikTok pulls the rug out from underneath you and you got to start all over yeah and i feel like you know being in law enforcement and, and being you know a presence on social media such as TikTok, because TikTok is huge mm -hmm. uh i feel like just being in law enforcement and having once you reach a, a large following and get a large following i feel like that's when you know, people start to get banned. You, you see like Officer Kingry last year got banned at, you know, over a million followers and mm -hmm. K9 Mattis got banned and then he's verified. I'm like, how do you ban a verified creator? Yeah. But, um, so I'm not going to say it'll never happen. I, I hope it doesn't happen, but that's why I try to keep my, my content the way it is. I try to keep it as, as fun and, um, and uplifting and positive and, and, things like that, you know, so I can stay on the right side of TikTok. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, yeah. Don't get on the, don't get on the wrong. Don't, don't venture over into the political side. Cause that just, I mean, you know, and I'm not blaming anybody, you know, that, that was me, you know, I, I did right. that TikTok and uh, you know, that, that, that pulled me over into the, into the political side of things. And of course I, you know, once, once you're in there, you know, you got the big liberal oh, creators yeah. that, that that come after you. And I, I was banned on the 4th of July last year. My original <laughs> account was banned at almost 600,000 followers. And I thought, wow, what on the 4th of July of all of all of the days? But um, yeah, you know, and and again, I, I started getting political, which, you know, I, that's fine. I feel like, uh, you know, I feel like there are you know, I had a platform and I could speak out on things that I thought were important to me and important for the, for the country. And, uh, but now I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get back into the more lighthearted side of things because, you know, even my followers say, you know, Nate, we love your skits. We love the funny stuff. We want to see more of that. Yep. And, uh, I interviewed. So last summer, I don't know if you follow Mark Lamb, the American sheriff from Arizona, Pinal County, Arizona. I, I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So he was on the podcast last summer and, you know, we were sort of, we were discussing it. It's like, man, everything is just 
dark and heavy and serious. I mean, because this was 2021 and we were talking about, you know, 2020, you had the pandemic, you had George Floyd. Cops just got, you know, just hammered, hammered. during hammered. 2020. And uh, it, it sucks that you have to address some of that, some of that heavy, serious stuff sometimes. And so now I'm trying to pull it back over into the, you know, put more levity into my videos and, you know, do right. some more skits that, that people enjoy. And, um, but every now and then I just, I get that, I get a wild hair and I gotta, I gotta do something, you know, political to, 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 to try and stick it to the left a little bit, but that's my own fault. Yeah. I, uh, I've, I've completely stayed out of the political realm, um, through my entire TikTok stint. And I, you know, I chose to do that one because when, once you start talking politics, everybody has such strong views, um, you know, yeah. everybody. And it becomes such a it, it starts a lot of drama that doesn't need to be started. And I like to keep my stuff drama free. Sure. Um, so anytime I've ever had anybody come in my my lives and, you know, Trump 2020 or or vote for Biden or whatever or anything political. Or ask me what my political stance is. I'm like, I don't talk about it. I'm not talking about it. We're not talking about it. And if yeah. you continue trying to talk about it, you're going to get blocked. I'm just not doing it. I don't want to. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Um, yeah. I don't shame anybody. I've got several good friends on TikTok uh, and Instagram that their entire accounts are nothing but political, you yeah. know. And and I got nothing against them. You do your thing. That's just not for me. Uh, I remember seeing your video with the LeBron James thing. I remember seeing that, and I laughed my ass off. I thought it was hilarious. So, <laughs> well, I appreciate I, it. Well, that was just me. <laughs> well, a lot of people did, but uh, I mean, it was there. I had a ton of support, but I also had a ton of opposition. There were a oh, ton absolutely. of haters that came out of the woodwork and just they wanted me dead. I mean, there were people. You know, they threatened me, they threatened my family, they threatened my daughter, mm -hmm. you know, they threatened the cops that I worked with. Um, it was it was insane and very surreal. It was a very surreal experience to see the amount of people that came out in support. Um, yep. You know, emails, letters, letters with money in it, you know, um, text messages. If they had my number, uh, DMs on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, you know, I couldn't keep up with all with all of the messages. Our, our department's um, internet server actually shut down because um, it was, there were so many emails coming in from, you know, from people wanting to either show support or, you know, people wanting interviews, things like that. But um, there was almost, I mean, an equal amount of haters and, and people opposing, you know, who wanted, who wanted a piece of me. They wanted me fired. They wanted me gone. They wanted me canceled. They wanted my oh, accounts absolutely. banned. You know, and the one thing I do, the one thing I notice, the one thing I've, I've noticed is that the haters are much more persistent than the supporters. Oh, which is sad because because support, I mean, you know, they got things to do. They got other things to do. You know, they got jobs. They've got their lives. They've got their, you know, they've got kids. They got responsibilities. And, you know, the people, it seems, uh, who are in opposition of, you know, law enforcement and conservatism and things like that don't have much more to do except troll the internet. Exactly. So that's their full-time job. And they, man, they came I, after oh, me hard. Yeah. I've, I've obviously uh, being a cop and being a, a, a larger presence on, on social media, I get my fair share of hate. I would mm -hmm. say, I would say, you know, majority of the comments I get, especially on my law enforcement related content, I, 95% is very positive and very supportive. Every now and then I'll get one of those hateful comments, especially if I have a video that, you know, blows up or goes viral or what's whatever. Yeah. Um, those will tend to get, you know, more hate, but for the most part, I get so much support. Um, I've had the threats I've, I've went through, you know, back when TikTok allowed people to send you messages that you weren't following back. Um, I remember getting, you know, getting death threats and, and getting, mm -hmm. You know, people sending me messages saying that you don't deserve to live. Your kids don't deserve you as a father. You need to go to work and get shot tonight. And, and just all those things. And I'm like, how do you like, why, why, like, what is your purpose? Like, does that make mm -hmm. you feel better to, mm -hmm. you know, to wish death upon somebody else just because you don't like me for what I wear? Yeah, that's essentially what it is. It, you know, it's what I wear. It's not who I am. 
Uh, I've been down that road, down that road as well. And it, it, it kind of weighs on, you know, it'll weigh on you a little bit. Uh, even though, you know, most of these people will never, ever meet you or never see you or anything still kind of weighs on you just to know that people are out there and, and they want to take your life for nothing more than the fact that you're a cop for yeah. the fact that you wear a badge, you know, you, you put on a uniform and to then that's what you chose to do, you know, as a career to support your family, people want to kill you for it. Mm -hmm. And I, to me, it's just, I've never been able to fathom it. I came into law enforcement when, um, the Ferguson, Missouri, um, yeah, issue Mike, going Michael on. Michael Brown case. Michael Park, yeah. Michael Brown. Yeah. Um, I was actually in the Academy, uh, when that was all taking place. So I came into law enforcement at a sticky time. Yeah. And then, you know, from there, it was just a snowball downhill mm -hmm. from there. Um, and then, of course, the George Floyd incident in in 2020, and but yeah, it's 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 definitely being a cop today is not an easy thing to do, and there's a lot of cops that are are leaving the profession because they can't handle the stress of of what we have to face and deal with every day. Yeah, well, and and not only that, I mean, I've <clears throat> so I've I've been contacted by by several several people. I mean, including I don't know if you if you uh, uh, heard of Officer uh, Matthew Degas from San Diego County or La Mesa PD. Um, there was an incident with him. I think it was uh, last year, where uh, you know he 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 dealt with a with, with a with a black person, a black suspect, low level use of force. You know, the guy was getting in his face. He had to just grab him by the shoulders and and kind of push him back down onto the bench that he was sitting on because he kept standing up and kept you know just acting kind of kind of froggy, kind of suspicious and uh, ended up putting him in cuffs, cited him with a misdemeanor and eventually let him out of handcuffs and let him go. Well, BLM rioted, you know, tore up the town of, of La Mesa. And then the DA there, Summer Stefan, prosecuted the officer because they had hired an outside and in, in, uh, private and in investigative agency to investigate him to determine if there was, you know, any, if he was culpable in, in, in any, in any of that, if he, if there was any wrongdoing uh, on his part and they determined that he falsified his police report, right. Quote unquote. And <laughs> she charged him. They went to trial. He was acquitted, but we're seeing a pattern of that, of, of woke DAs prosecuting police officers for doing their jobs. And so, I mean, I can't blame police officers for either walking off the job or people who have aspirations of going into law enforcement and saying, uh, "Nope, no, no, thanks. I don't, I don't want to get involved with that." You know, uh, yeah, I'm the same the way. Atmosphere. I'm the same way. I know people personally who have left law enforcement for just the reason of it, the stress. You know, yeah. it's a, it's a stressful situation, and I tell people all the time that I don't stress about. I mean, I'm not going to say I don't stress about normal everyday life because we all do at some and to some degree. But I really don't stress about it to the point to where it worries me or, you know, I get bothered by anything. The one thing I stress about is going to work every day and getting in my patrol car and knowing I have a target painted on my back just because mm -hmm. of, of the fact that I decided to be a police officer. Yeah. Um, you know, so I stress about making it home safely for my family and and for my partner to make it safely you know home to his family like those are the things that i stress about yeah and it, it, i don't think that the general public understands exactly you know how it feels to have a target painted on your back every day just because of what we chose to do with our lives yeah you know you i know. try to tell people all the time that you know my the badge that i wear does not define the person that I am. Right. You know, instead, I define what it is to wear that badge. Yeah. Which is which is great and I and I I wish more officers felt and thought along those same lines. The best training that I ever went to was Emotional Sur Survival for Law Enforcement. It was taught by Dr. Kevin Gilmartin. I don't know if you've heard of him or if you've read his book or been to his training. But uh, and he was actually featured in the series Southland. They actually had an episode where these officers were handed his book and told to read it. Um, but I went to his training twice. Best training I ever went to. It's essentially about you have to have an identity outside of being a cop. 
because oh, it's a job, you know, and it's a it can be an intrinsically meaningful job. It can bring you a lot of fulfillment in life if that's what you enjoy doing and you can you know and you can do it the job in that manner. But that can be taken away from you, uh, you know, at, at any at any moment. And if and a lot of cops do, they they make that their identity. They live, eat and sleep and breathe police work. And if for some reason that's taken away from them, then it's a total crisis. And, you know, they have to they have to kind of refigure out what what life is again. And his training mm -hmm. is about, listen, you're you, the police work is your job. It's your career. It's not your identity. It's not who you are. You need to have hobbies. You need to have relationships. Uh, your relationships are the most important, whether it's with your spouse, whether it's with your children, with your parents, brothers, sisters, friends. And you have to have hobbies and other things that you do that make up your identity outside of police work. Because police work will take everything from you and give you jack shit in return. Absolutely it'll, it'll right. chew you up and spit you out. And yep. if you if you jump in with both feet and give everything to law enforcement, you're not going to get much back. As you know, it's a thankless job. Like you said, you got a target on your back every day and there's not very many people who extend their hand to shake your hand and say, thank you for the work that you do. It happens very seldomly. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with you hundred percent. I've always been the type that, you know, I don't bring work home. Even when I was, even when I was in the military, um, you know, I, I don't bring work home. You know, I leave when I take that uniform off, I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm done being a cop for the day. Then I can become dad. I can become, you know, boyfriend to, uh, to my girlfriend that I have. I can become son to my parents, friend to all the friends I have, you know, yeah. once that uniform comes off, I'm no longer officer Scott. I'm yeah. Ben gray Scott or yeah. to everybody on TikTok, I'm TikTok peacock. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and I think, like you said, I think a lot of officers, a lot of a lot of guys and girls get in this profession and they don't know how to shut it off. They don't know how to turn it off or when to turn it off. Yeah. You know, they stay in that mindset 24 seven and it's not healthy for anybody. No. Well, and I think, you know, a part of that comes from the it comes from the academy. You know, if you're if you go to an academy, you know, and you and you train and, and you know, you you're, you're taught for whatever it is, 10 to 20 weeks, depending on whatever state you're in. I mean, you're just, it's grilled into you every single yeah. day, you know, officer yeah. safety, you know, things like that. And that's, that's the biggest thing is officer safety. And you got to be hyper vigilant 24 seven, even if you're, you know, you're not on duty. And so that gets instilled in people, they internalize that and it becomes part of who they are. I didn't learn until after, you know, after my divorce, which, and I, I attribute my law enforcement career as a, you know, one of the, one of the factors that was, you know, that, that contributed to my, to my divorce, um, because I didn't know how to compartmentalize at the time. I didn't know how to leave work at work and be a good husband when I was at home and to be a good father when I was at home, it took me a minute. And again, that training from Dr. Kevin Gilmartin helped me to understand that it's like, huh, yeah, this, this job really isn't giving me a lot back. You know, I get a pretty measly paycheck every month and that's about it so i need to start taking care of the people around me the people that i care about and the people that care about me because that's much more important so and i don't know if you've had a similar experience i mean you mentioned that you were divorced you know you don't have to give us the details but i don't know if your law enforcement career contributed to that at all but it's not uncommon I'm not yeah i'm not gonna sit here and you know hearing you say that i'm, I'm not gonna say it, it that it didn't because I'm sure in some, in some facet it did, you know, um, I, when I was a rookie officer, I remember being a rookie and straight out of the police academy, I was gung ho. Let me get into everything. Let me do everything. Let me write every ticket I can write. Let me, I wanted to be that guy. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I yeah. wanted to be that, that hard nosed police officer that I didn't cut breaks. I didn't, I wanted to take everybody to jail. I could take the jail write every ticket I could write. And then after my rookie year and, and starting to develop that, that, uh, personality and that, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? I was, I was that cop. 
Yeah. I was like, you know, I don't I don't want to be that cop. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be, oh, well, if, if Officer Scott pulls you over, you're definitely getting a ticket. Mm-hmm. Or if Officer Scott, you know, catches you with this, you're definitely going to jail. Yeah. After my rookie year, I didn't want to do that. Right. And I think more so in my rookie year and probably on into my second year of law enforcement too, you know, I think probably then I was I was that guy that was a cop 24-7. I was mm-hmm. that guy that I, I took it home. I took it wherever we went, you know, I, I didn't turn it off because that's what I loved and what I knew as I got older and more mature, I started to realize, you know, this is not what I need to do. I need to be able to turn it off. I need to go home and, and be a dad, be a husband, uh, and be a son and, and all those things. Um, so I think same, it, it took me a couple of years to figure that out. Unfortunately, I didn't have the training, um, I think that would be excellent training, especially for, you know, I mean, for any law enforcement officer, really, Mm -hmm. um, you know, the new guys, especially, I think the new guys really need to need to be able to understand that before they get to a point in their life where there's no turning back. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you can, I mean, you can, there, there is a point where you're, where you're like, wow, I've been so enveloped in this job that I have neglected literally every other part of my life right. and it's falling and apart around me. You're going to ruin friendships. You're going to ruin relationships, you know, and, and, and then once it's all done and, and said, it's like, well, shit, now what do I have? I've got yeah. this job. Yep. I got this job where, I mean, in Idaho, you know, the median salary for police officers is 44 grand a year. You know, mm. is that worth sacrificing a relationship with your spouse or your, Right. Your brother, your friends, your, you know, your kids. And, you know, for me, it was my daughter. I have one, I have one child. Um, I have one daughter. She's 17 now. And that was a wake up call for me, you know, after, after my divorce. And I realized, man, this job is consuming me and I need to, I, I need to, you know, I need to put up some walls here. I need to compartmentalize this because I did not want to lose my relationship with my daughter and be, and be that, that deadbeat father, you know, that you know, kind of like the right. stereotypical, you know, salty detective you see in the movies who, you know, doesn't see their kid very often. You know what I mean? I mean, that's, that's 20, a real thing. Just, and I yeah, wasn't going to be that. seven work. Mm-hmm. Yep. I wasn't going to do that. And so, and, and thank God for that training. Like I said, I went to it twice because it was so good. I'm like, I need to hear this again. I need a refresher on this. And, you know, uh, Dr. Gil Martin, he's funny. Uh, you know, former Marine, former law enforcement, you know, so he's got all of the experience, all of the training, obviously the education and, uh, you know, his, 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 pr- the premise of his training is, look, you need to, you need to realize what's important. Yeah. Police work is important. Sure. We need good men and women doing that job. But at the end of the day, your family is more important. Your, your Absolutely. close relationships with your friends are more important and you are more your mental health is more important than this job. Yes. I think, you know, I, I did a podcast uh, last year with a guy named Josh. Um, he's got a um, an organization called What Makes Us Fire. He's a firefighter out of, okay. I think, Houston, Texas. And he's got an organization called What Makes Us Fire. And that's actually the name of his podcast as well. I met him through TikTok. He, he came into one of my lives last year. Um, and was like, hey, man, I'd love to have you on my podcast. And his podcast and is strictly about mental illness and, and mm-hmm. mental health awareness in public service. You know, firefighters, cops, EMS, military, um, anybody that works in civil service. And the the whole premise is just basically talking about the stigmatism of mental health. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's something that nobody wants to talk about. Nobody wants to check on. Nobody, yeah. you know everybody's so worried about your physical health. Well, how many pushups can you do? How can you, can you run a mile and a half this, this much time, you know, yep. how's your physical health, but nobody really checks what's going on up here. Yeah. They're not worried about that. And so his organization is, is there to, to try to open up that realm, you know, for first responders and, and give first responders like a, a basically a platform to talk and say, well, this is, this is what I have. Yeah. Um, I think he's his organization is they're still getting all the things turning, um, but they're trying to make it to where if a first responder needs to get help, you know, mental health, 
they need to go to therapy or whatever the case may be, and they have mm-hmm. to miss work. His organization is going to pay for their bills and, and all the things they need to do while yeah. he's off of work, you know, because obviously workman's comps probably not going to cover that. Sure. Uh, so it's a really good organization. And, uh, and that podcast last year, well, I think me and him ended up talking for like two and a half hours. Uh, yeah. We went well over the time that we expected to, but it was mm-hmm. just such a deep and good conversation between the two of us um, that, I mean, I don't, it, it was a good experience. And the guys are, he's a great guy, great guy. Well, like you said, mental health is one of those things that there's a stigma attached to it where people feel like, oh, you know, I, I can't admit that I need that I need somebody to talk to, that I need some, but I need some assistance with this or else I'm going to yep. be viewed as weak. And then I'm going to have exactly. that. You know, I'm going to have that. I'm going to be labeled that way, you know, and we need to get away from that that way of thinking. And I talk about this in my book, you know, so this is not a secret. But, you know, I the the best thing I ever did for myself was go to counseling. I actually was mm-hmm. uh, put on FMLA for three months with uh, my first agency and got counseling during that time weekly. And it was the best thing that I ever could have done. And, you know, it's it's just if nothing else, it's just cathartic. It's a way to get the poison out. You know what I mean? It's kind of like if you're sick to your stomach and you need to throw up and you throw up and you, you, you feel better. Like if nothing else, you know, it, it's good for that. But it does help people sort of heal and acknowledge, you know, some of the secondary and vicarious trauma that they experience on the job. It builds up, especially if you're working cases like sex crimes involving children, you know, or you're working, you know, homicides, suicides, those things will take their toll as much as you want to be oh, the absolutely. tough guy and, and and think that you can deal with all of it, especially if you're a family man and you got kids and you got people that you love around you, you start to internalize that stuff and it, it will affect you. And if, if you think you're, you're, you know, you're the tough guy and you don't need counseling, I, I you know, I'll, I'll put money on it that eventually it's going to catch up to you and you're, and you're going to need it one way or the other. I remember the, the first call, I ever took involving a child, a, a de- death of a child. Uh, and I remember it like it was yesterday and I, I'll never forget it. My children were very young at the time. My daughter was maybe two. My son was um, five. And we had gotten a call about a, uh, about an eight year old girl that was being rushed from one of, one of our like walk-in clinics. Mm-hmm. She was being rushed by ambulance to the ER, not breathing. And they wanted us to basically escort them, even though they're running lights and sirens, you know, they wanted us to escort them because this is a critical situation. Yeah. So of course we escort them. We get to the ER. It's, it's one big family at that point there, the firefighters, the police were all working together trying to save this girl's life. The doctors, nurses, everybody, um, ended up the, you know, the girl ended up passing away. I think it was, I think she'd had the flu and, Mm -hmm. but yeah, eight years old, she ended up passing away. And that right there weighed so heavy on me because I have children. And I think any parent, you know, my lieutenant was there with me. He was in tears. I don't think there was a dry in that, in that ER at the time. Yeah. Um, I got off work. I didn't leave work till like probably one o'clock in the morning that yeah. morning. And I drove straight home, bawling my eyes out. And I immediately got home and I went and climbed in bed with my son. Yeah. And I just laid there and I loved on him and I hugged him and, and just cuddled up with him for a good like 30 minutes to an hour. Got out of the bed with him. I went straight to my daughter's room. She had she was still in a crib at the time. I jumped in the crib with her and I just cuddled with her for, you know, another hour. And it yeah. was just one of those moments where it's like, you know, you hear about children dying every day and, and it's a, it's terrible. But to actually see it and to be there firsthand, it, it, it was something that, you know, for me, it, it killed me. It killed yeah. me inside because I am a dad. And I'm like, and this was the people, the little girl was the people's only kid. You know, so I, I couldn't imagine. Like, I'm like, I just, I couldn't imagine losing a child. Like, the pain that that, that you would feel. Yeah. So, you know, when I, yeah, so I. That 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 right there is one of those things for me that I'll never forget. You know, I, that'll live with me for the rest of my life. You know, going back to, you know, you, you were talking about the people that wish death upon police officers simply for wearing the badge. 
um, the, the types of experiences that you were just explaining. They have no idea that police officers carry those things with them their entire lives, you know, especially police officers with kids. I was a detective for five years with my original agency and I was on call one night and literally it was like six o'clock, just barely had gotten off work. I was going to jujitsu. I get a call of a, of a trailer fire and, you know, two young boys had died in this fire and it was a, you know, a trailer park camper trailer type, you know, type RV park. And uh, what had happened was the mother, she had three kids, two boys and a daughter. And the mother goes outside to, to make a call on her cell phone. And the, the oldest boy closed the door. It was December. Closed the door, you know, turned the deadbolt to kind of play a prank on his mom. Like, ha ha, mom locked you out. Well, they had a space heater inside that little tiny camper trailer. And someone left a blanket too close to the heater. And a uh, blanket caught fire. The whole trailer went up. The little girl was able to get out through a window but the two little boys got trapped inside the uh, inside the camper, burned to death. And not only, you know, dealing dealing with that, investigating that, seeing two like, a, you know, a five year old and a seven year old boy, you know, burned, charred bodies, going to the autopsy, things like that. But then interviewing the mother and listening to her explain how she tried to literally claw her way through the wall of the camper to get to her boys. You know, her hands are busted and bleeding and fingernails missing because she's trying to get to her boys. Those things, those are the types of calls that, you know, stick with you. Those are the investigations that you never forget, you know, especially Absolutely. if you're a parent mm -hmm. and it'd be, it would be, you know, wouldn't it be nice if people like you were, you know, describing the people that hate cops, the people that think cops are, you know, corrupt and racist. If they, if they they knew exactly how how much we empathized with people who lose children or lose loved ones, you know, and we have to kind of experience that with them while we're on the job, uh, you know, maybe it would help sort of bridge the gap between, you know, law enforcement and the community in general, at least the community oh, that, you know, that that opposes law enforcement. Absolutely. Yeah, I. Um, I've tried to use my platform for the last you know, two years to basically just to show people that cops are human. Now I'm, I'm also a realist and I also realize that in this profession, as in any other profession, there are bad apples. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm one of these guys that's going to tell you every day. Yeah. There's absolutely bad cops in America. I'm not going to sit here and downplay that. Yeah. But I also try to tell people for every one bad cop you deal with or for every one bad experience you have with a with a cop you're gonna have 10 to 15 good ones you know so mm -hmm. why let that one bad experience or that one bad cop sh overshadow your mind and and cloud your judgment on the way you feel about everybody else the one yeah. thing i hear or i get so much in comments or, or used to in lives not so much anymore but the one thing i would get is um all cops in America are this or all cops in America are that. I'm like, well, how do you know that? Do you know every cop in America? Mm -hmm. There's 950,000 cops in America. Yeah. If you know 950,000 cops, that's impressive, you know, yeah. but you know, you're, you're generalizing your opinion based on one experience you might've had, or, or maybe two or three experiences you've had. But I've, I've, as a cop in the last eight years, you know, I try to sway, at least one person's experience or one person's judgment or beliefs or views on the way they look at cops from negative yeah. to good. If I can do, if I can get one person to change their mindset every day, then, you know, I feel like I'm making a difference because that one person is going to go and tell 10 of their friends. Well, yeah. then their 10 friends are going to go and tell 20 of their friends. And the next thing you know, it's spreading like wildfire. So that's one thing that I've tried to use my platform for. And, and anytime I deal with people in the public, I do, I promote myself. I say, Hey, go check out my TikTok, man. If you want to mm -hmm. see some good, funny stuff, go look at my TikTok. You'll see, you, you'll see what I'm about and who I am. Yeah. Um, so, well, that's, I don't know. no, that's, I mean, that's good. It's, I mean, the, you know, the problem is we're fighting, we're fighting the mainstream media, you know, we're, we're fighting politicians, <laughs> you know, day. it's, uh, it's a it's a losing battle when you know when the cops themselves uh you know they they don't have representation you know we have to we have to show people ourselves that hey we're exactly. not the bad guys you know 
we're, we're the good, we're the good people. You know, we've, we've got hearts, we have compassion, we have empathy for people and we're not out there trying to make people's lives miserable. We're just, we're just trying to do a job that uh, we swore an oath to do literally swore an oath to do. Um, but you know, when you have media and elected officials and other people trying to, you know, vilify the police every day, it's, it, it's hard. It's hard to convince people otherwise of what they're hearing. I mean, you have people who haven't even had bad experiences with the cops, you know, they hear their cousin or their friend or somebody else talk about a bad experience. Yep. And so then, like you say, they generalize that, you know, onto the whole of the law enforcement community as a whole. And, yeah. you know, you know, it's not fair, but that's what we have to deal with. It, it is. I had a kid. Well, this is probably like three or four weeks ago. Um, I had a, a child, 10 years old. I went to I, we had gotten invited to this little they were having like a youth night at this church and they had basically invited all the youth of the community to come to this church and they were playing football and basketball and they were eating, had jumpers, the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. And of course I'm a big community policing type of officer. I love sure. being involved in the community. I love being involved with the youth. Um, so this is right up my alley. So I get out there, I'm playing football with the kids. I'm playing basketball with kids, sweating my butt off. And uh, then all the kids, they want to see the patrol car, obviously. Sure. So so I take them over. I'm letting them climb through the patrol car, press all the buttons, hit all the, you know, gadgets and sirens, all the night, everything. Yeah. Well, then one of the little boys who happened to be a, a, a little black boy, he was about 10 years old, 10 or 11. He gets in my back seat and uh, he's like, oh, he's like, shut the door, shut the door. And I was like, you know, I had the windows down. I was like, okay. And he's like, just don't kill me. And I took a step back. And he's like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm like, no, no, no. You you said it for a reason. Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, sir. No, no, sir. I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize. And so at that point, I was like, you know what? I could have gotten mad. I could have gotten angry. But I was like, I'm going to use this as a teaching moment for this child. Because children are sponges. They, they grasp on to everything we're telling them. Even when we think they're not listening, they are. And uh, so I used that moment for, you know, to, to teach this young man, like, listen, what you see on the news or what you hear your friends say or what you hear, heaven forbid, your parents say or your family members say, it's not always the case. Yeah. I was like, ha, ha, at any point out here, have I threatened to hurt any one of you? Yeah. Well, no, sir. I said, have, at any point, have you felt like your life was in danger at any point today? Well, no, sir. I, it's been fun. I was like, exactly. I said, so don't let what other people are telling you. Don't let them cloud your judgment. Mm -hmm. You know, think for yourself. Develop yeah. your own opinion. And I was like, let this right here be that moment for you. And he was like, yes, sir. And at the end of it, you know, he, he shook my hand and he went on and played with the rest of the kids. But, you know, I try to use moments like that to, to teach rather than get angry or get upset and, and you know, yeah. make them feel less than what they are yeah well and i mean like i said it's an uphill battle you got to use you got to take those opportunities to teach you know especially like when you said when they're little kids you know that that maybe that you know god willing maybe that's the only time he'll ever have to encounter a police officer and he'll remember you know officer scott man he was so nice to me and he you know he let me in the back of his patrol car and he let me push the buttons and everything and you know he was so kind to me and then, you know, maybe maybe that'll, like you said, grow exponentially. He'll tell his friends who will, who will tell their friends and, you know, he'll tell his kids, you know, when when whenever that time comes. But and that's, you know, we, the, that's the hope. Yeah. Yeah. So, we, I mean, we, we've talked about some heavy stuff. What's what's one of the funniest or lighthearted moments you've ever had in your career as, as a cop? What's I mean, if there's anything that comes to mind. Man, I had people ask me all the time, what's the best excuse I've ever had when I pulled somebody over? I had this woman. This was probably probably my second or third year in law enforcement. I stopped mm -hmm. this old woman, and she was at, at least 70. Um, <laughs> I get her pulled over. She's running like 50 miles an hour in a 30-mile-an-hour zone, which, you know, if, if you know like I do, old people typically don't speed. They typically sure. don't speed. They, they're they typically under the speed limit. So as soon as I get her pulled over and I see it's this old lady, I get to the window. 
Officer Scott, the reason I stopped you, ma'am, is because you're running, you know, 50 miles an hour, 30 mile an hour zone. I said, where are you heading to today? And she's sweating bullets. And she said, son, she said, I'm not going to lie to you. She said, I'm about to shit my pants. <laughs> she said, I'm trying, I'm trying to get home. I live right down the road. <laughs> not lying to me you know what i mean like yeah this is legit this is legit so i'm like listen you go on and get home <laughs> i can escort you if you need me to <laughs> yeah i don't like i, be I get it <laughs> i don't want to be the reason that you that you crap yourself okay so that to me that was one one of those moments that that will always stand out for me uh it was and it wasn't an excuse. I, I gen, genuinely believe that that woman literally was about to, you know, shit her pants. Shit, her, shit herself <laughs> right in the side of the road. I don't want to be responsible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm not dealing with this. Um, I want to do that. So um, I was on patrol one day and I stopped this guy and, you know, he ended up being uh, under the influence and, you know, he refused to take the test, you know, do field sobriety and, you know, breathalyzer, all that stuff. So our procedure then was to take him to the ER. Well, the ER always required a, a, a urine sample. So they had this special bathroom that, you know, that we could take him into. And um, I let him out of his handcuffs and I'm standing outside the door. I'm like, you need to pee in this cup, you know, so that the ER staff can take it and test it. And He's like, well, I can't pee. I'm like, well, just try, you know, just, you know, whatever you're, you're drunk. You're going to be able to pee at some point, you know? <laughs> so, and he's probably like 50 years old, maybe, 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 maybe younger because, you know, he's, he was doing, doing a little bit of meth throughout his life, but, uh, he's, uh, and he's getting upset. He's like, I just can't do what I can't pee. And I'm, you know, at this point it's been like 20, 30 minutes and, and I'm trying to be patient with him, you know, and he's, he's just kind of sitting there just trying to pee in this cup and he can't. And I'm like, well, just, you know, try the, the warm water trick, you know? So when you think of the warm water trick, usually you'd you run the warm water and you put your hand underneath it and it kind of stimulates you to have to urinate, you know? So that's what I'm thinking in my mind. And so I close the door and I wait a couple of minutes and I open the door back up and this guy's got his junk in the sink, splashing water all over his junk. <laughs> and he's sobbing. He's crying. He's like, I can't do it. And I close the door and I just laugh my ass off. I'm like, what the hell is this guy doing? <laughs> and of course I told everybody, I'm like, this guy's this guy's got his oh, this his whole junk in the sink. We're gonna have to sanitize this whole place. <laughs> so I'm like, dude, just stop. Stop what you're doing. Get your dick out of the sink. You know, like put, pull your pants up. This is ridiculous. Put it away. Put it away. Yep, put it away. That's enough. Oh. Uh, drunk people i tell you i don't know if it's the same if you've had the same experience that i've had but i've i've had a lot of dui arrests in my mm -hmm. career and i will say about every female i've ever arrested has tried to fight or has been very verbally abusive mm -hmm. yeah but about every male i've ever arrested cried yeah <laughs> it's like the the guys even the big the big burly you know dudes that you think are gonna fight you tooth and nail like those dudes cry harder than than anybody and i'm yep. like this is i'm i'm expecting like to fight and and you're over here you know wanting to hug it out like okay <laughs> But then I arrest this little 90 pound girl that will, you know, she's soaking wet 90 pounds and she's mm -hmm. drunk and she wants to fight me like the biggest guy at a bar. Oh yeah. So, yep. I I've had it. I've had a few, I've had a few of those, man. Like, I tell you what, the, the calls the, come out. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. They, they get, they get scrappy. Um, one of the worst fights I'd ever been in. We, uh, we used to have a bar here. It's been torn down since, but, uh, it was, it was owned by, by a family here and the uh the owner's son used to play football for for university of washington he was offensive lineman he was about six five three hundred pounds and he, we get a call that was night shift this was like 2008 we get a call from inside the bar that hell's angels bikers are there and they're about ready to kill somebody so of course mm. we all haul ass out to this bar 
sheriff's department shows up, you know, even like some of the other outside peripheral agencies, smaller agencies show up and we're parked in the middle of the road and we're standing there and it's just like a normal Friday night. Like people are outside, you know, they're drinking and chatting it up and it's like, well, nobody doesn't look like there's anybody fighting or anything. And so we have an officer go inside to try and find out who made the call. Well, meantime, the owner's son, he comes out and sees that the cops are kind of standing around and he gets pissed off because, you know, people are going to start leaving and he's going to lose business and he's drunk. And he starts yelling at us, get the fuck out of here. You guys, you don't need to be here. There's no reason for the cops to be here. And he's, you know, just yelling and cussing. Well, we had this, you know, this little sawed off officer. He had kind of a complex, you know, and <laughs> he goes and gets in this guy's face. And this officer is like five, nine, you know, a hundred and, 70 pounds and he's in this guy's face and he's pointing his finger at him. He's like, we can be here if we want to. And we're going to come in and inspect your liquor license right now. Well, this in the bartender who is sober, you know, he's like, Oh no, he's just drunk. Please don't worry about him. There's no reason to come in. It's okay. We got everything under control. Well, the drunk guy, you know, former offensive lineman pushes the other officer. And so I push him back. You know, and I'm yelling at him, don't put your fucking hands on the police officer. Well, there was a live band right behind him. And when I pushed him, he stumbled into the drum set and <laughs> toppled everything over. And at this point, like everybody in the bar just went nuts. They wanted to attack the cops. Well, there were four or five bouncers there. They're like, no, 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 don't get involved. Don't get involved. Well, this guy stands up and I'm kind of, you know, head on a swivel, making sure I'm not going to get jumped from behind or something. And he punches me right in the face. You know, this this dude and I, you know, this blue shook it off and we traded punches for, you know, what seemed like an eternity, but it was only a couple of seconds. We ended up tasing this guy like three times and had to put three sets of handcuffs on him because he was so big, Jeez. you know, just I was like, good God, I had a, you know, I had a kind of a little black eye, but, you know, we had to take him, you know, to, we took him to the jail and the jail wanted him medically cleared. So we had to take him to the ER to get him medically cleared and. That was, oh, a, yeah. I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad he was drunk. Otherwise, you know, <laughs> yeah, <if laughs> he, he might've so knocked might me out. <laughs> yeah. But I see him around still every now and then he comes up and shakes my hand. I've got one of those guys that I had one of my very first DUIs, uh, this big old guy, he was about 300 pounds, probably about six foot two, six foot three, older gentleman. And he was drunk. And me and uh, the officer I was working with at the time, we fought this guy tooth and nail to get him in cuffs. Mm -hmm. Tooth and nail. Every time we get one hand behind his back, he would jerk the other. <laughs> and it ended up, you know, we, we tased him three or four times. Uh, my other officer ended up, uh, the guy tried to grab my officer's gun at one point, And my officer had one hand on the gun. And then reach around with his right hand and punch dude square in the nose. This guy was on his knees behind his car. Yeah. And we're behind him trying to get him under control. And all I heard was pop. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> of course, the guy's nose has exploded. There's blood everywhere. So we finally oh. got him in cuffs and finally got him loaded in the back of the car. Same thing. We had to take him to the ER, which was right down the road and uh get him medically cleared you know because of his busted up nose yeah but yeah i just remember like i was i i think i was a rookie i think it was my rookie year so when he hit him i was really kind of like whoa like okay <laughs> you just hit him <laughs> yeah, this, is, this is how we do business over here all right but i didn't i hadn't realized at that point i didn't realize that the guy actually had like reached around was trying to get you know my sergeant's gun at the time yeah. uh so once he had explained that, he was like, no, his hand was on my gun. He was like, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, well, that makes sense. I would have probably punched him too. Like, Yeah, yeah, that's not smart. Yeah. That's not smart In the at heat all. of the moment. Jesus. But, uh, man. People, uh, people are crazy. Yeah, they are. And they get, especially when they're drunk, they get they get real stupid. And they get brave and they get oh, tough when, when they're drunk. They're very you know? brave. And then, yep. uh, then when they sober up, they're, they, you know, they want to be apologetic. You know, I can't. I can't count the number of, uh, you know, phone calls and emails that I got to my work email about, you know, hey, Officer Sylvester, I'm real sorry about, you know, the way I acted, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or it's a few days later, or, you know, uh, you know, after they get out of jail, like, I apologize yep. for that. That wasn't me. 
yeah, yeah, that was this guy. He he did the same thing. We saw him. We actually, I ran into him. We were having like a festival downtown, uh, like a few weeks later, and he come up to me, shook my hand. He said, ah, "I just, I just really want to apologize about that night." And he was like, "You know, I was clearly in the wrong. I was under the influence, and drunk." And he said, "I I just want to apologize to you guys." And I was like, "Hey, I appreciate it. You know, no yeah. hard feelings on my behalf." So yeah, you're like I'm just I, doing I my job. How that worked out? Yeah, I'm just. I get this uh, all the time. To to jail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not. It's mm. another day in the office for me. Right. Well, let's see. Where can uh, where can people find you? TikTok Peacock on uh, on TikTok, obviously. What about? Uh, TikTok, I know you got an Instagram uh, account. Yeah, Instagram. It's the underscore TikTok underscore Peacock. Um, you can find me on on both TikTok and Instagram. Um, my Instagram, you know, it's, it's more, I have a lot of my TikToks posted there as well. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's related to my TikTok, but I do post some personal stuff. You know, there's a lot of pictures of me and my girlfriend there. Uh, you'll see pictures of me and my kids and things like that too. Uh, oh. but yeah, those are, those are the two social media platforms I use the most. Um, and if you're looking for some good, fun, you know, wholehearted content definitely go check me out oh yeah go to go to gray's tiktok page it's i mean it, it's he's he's funny he's lighthearted. he's goofy he's silly he, he knows how to dance and uh you know he'll <laughs> he, he'll make you laugh he'll show you the lighter side of of law enforcement but great this has been a lot of fun man i, I appreciate you joining Absolutely. me um this has been a fun episode and we'll have to uh have to have a follow-up episode in the in the near future oh, absolutely so. Absolutely. I enjoyed it. And I, uh, man, I, like I said, I think I've, I've put this out there on my lives before, but I've, I've followed you for a long time, you know, before even TikTok, like I, Facebook and YouTube, all of it. Uh, so, you know, when you started following me on TikTok, I was like, Oh, what? Like, okay, this is cool. And then when you <laughs> asked me to be on the show, I was, I was like, all right, this is, this is freaking awesome. Oh. So I appreciate you for having me on the show. Um, well, dude, this anytime. It's been pretty cool. Anytime. We'll have to do a we'll have to go live on on TikTok. These these uh TikToks TikToks very particular. They don't they don't really let you stream on these on these other platforms, you know, like like Facebook and YouTube does, but yeah. uh yeah, man, I I love your channel. I love your TikTok page. You know, it reminds me of my TikTok page back in the day before everything got so complicated. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, this has been fun, man. And thanks everybody in the chat uh, for showing up for all your comments. Uh, yeah, go follow, go follow Gray TikTok Peacock on TikTok. You'll you'll get a laugh. You'll get a kick out of it. Um, so thanks again, everybody, and we will see you all next time.